This is George Rogers welcoming you to WMAR-TV's five-part series, Bars to Progress. This is the first comprehensive study of Maryland's correctional system. Because that system has the power to impede antisocial activity or unwittingly encourage it, its effectiveness is of paramount importance to every citizen. Later in this series, we shall examine efforts to rehabilitate offenders. See what happens to a man when he returns from prison to society and also examine the alternatives for changing the present system so that both society and offender benefit. In this first half hour, however, we shall concentrate on the effectiveness of the big house, or large institution for housing prisoners. What specifically does the big house do? Protect? Punish? Does it reform? Bring about a feeling of penance, as the titles reformatory and penitentiary suggest. Or does it actually change the offender for the worse? In Maryland, there are four big houses. The most macabre architecturally is the Maryland Penitentiary at 954 Forest Street, Baltimore. Built before the turn of the century, the Maryland Penitentiary houses more than a thousand men, either as full-time inmates or those undergoing diagnostic examination prior to reassignment to another institution. The Maryland House of Correction at Jessup is the most densely populated of Maryland's big houses. Within its walls, approximately 1,400 men live in what is classified as a medium security institution. From the standpoint of bars per square foot, however, the House of Correction's main hall is an impressive sight indeed, resembling the interior of a giant birdcage. Some 50 miles west in rural Maryland is the more modern Maryland Correctional Institution for Males at Hagerstown. It houses about 600 inmates, chiefly young offenders. Like Jessup, it is classified medium security, but utilizes closed circuit television as one means of ensuring that the doors open and close only for the right people. And finally, there is the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women at Jessup. Because of the 30 to 1 male-female arrest ratio, there are only about 100 women here. The institution has the look of a college campus, but looks can be deceiving. Both inmate and official state that despite its charming appearance, the institution for women still generates all the pressures of big house life. Just what are these pressures? To find out, WMAR-TV not only interviewed hundreds of inmates, guards, and officials, but put its own reporter in a correctional institution for a day. Like the other new man, he began his sentence by walking through the main door of the Maryland Penitentiary. This is your orientation. You've already been brought into the system. You've been to identification. You've been given a number. They've taken your fingerprints. They go to Washington, D.C. Uh, we'll get back an FBI report on every man. Orientation for new inmates takes place in the chapel of the penitentiary and is followed by a battery of psychological tests, identification procedures, and lectures. It is the beginning of what one ex-offender called the making of a non-person, but the classification system is probably not much more impersonal than induction into the armed forces or registering for classes at a large state university. This building right here is a Maryland penitentiary. It's a maximum security institution, long-term offenders, disciplinary problems, adjustment problems, um, troublemakers. That's a Maryland Penitentiary. The truly unfortunate aspect of the classification process is that it throws the first-time offender in with those who have been incarcerated many times before. This situation, which officials hope to correct in the future, exposes the new man to more competent and hardened offenders 
and furthers his education in the modern school of crime. Joe, as a result of your being confined here, what has happened to your attitude about crime? Has it improved? As far as methods for doing crime, you know, I've, I've, like I've learned crime about a thousand times better, you know, more ways to do things. You know, I've been here three times now, so uh, all I've learned how to do was, you know, how to do things a lot better without getting caught the next time. You know. Because it is too time consuming, WMAR TV reporter Andy Barth was not sent through the classification process. Instead, he was assigned to the House of Correction at Jessup, along with a group of other men. Handcuffed and wearing yellow coveralls, he then boarded the bus with a certain amount of apprehension. The, uh, the bus was the part of it probably that I feared the most, uh, mostly because it would be unsupervised and uncontrolled situation. I didn't have any trouble. I had uh, a lot of fear, which receded fairly quickly. I can't really say that it ever left me, but. Everywhere we'd stop, they'd uh, take an inventory of what weapons the, the guards had, and uh, lots of talk that there was more weaponry than was needed. Also, a lot of assessing of the fences and the possibility of getting through or over them. And when we got here, it was uh, pretty unanimously decided no one was getting out until his time had come. After disembarking, reporter Barth begins the process of officially becoming an inmate at the House of Correction. It begins with a change of clothing in a large room, a situation that is perhaps symbolic of prison life in general, in that it is the first of a series of private acts performed without privacy. And though still outwardly calm, Andy Barth admits to continued apprehension. I can't really say that uh, I enjoyed any of it. Uh, I wasn't petrified. When we got inside, we went into a main room uh, where they stripped off the yellow coveralls that I'd put on in Baltimore. They gave us all uh, new brown outfits, uh, pants and shirt, and took down a list of the 10 people that we wanted to have visit us. I had uh, WMAR station people at the top of my list. A bit later, Andy Barth is escorted to his cell. This is his first contact with a general prison population, but because of his brief stay, he will be able to capture only a taste of the atmosphere. He may sense the dark moodiness around him. He may feel eyes assessing him as a sexual object. If he remained for a longer time, according to those who've seen the system from a closer vantage point, he would come in contact with the real evils and pressures of Big House existence. You see, a man can be, uh... Uh, he has to be fearful of his life. All he can worry about is the next 10 minutes. He can be in his cell and he can get hit by three or four guys. They can rob him, steal everything he has. He can be walking down the, the, the hallway. He can get raped. He can get mugged. He's got to worry all the time, particularly if the guy is young, if he's slight. Uh, he's considered effeminate. Now, one of the big problems we have today are all of the young fellows coming in the big joint because the old guys they had a lifestyle that they were pretty much accustomed to and they were you know like pretty comfortable with it now you get the young guys coming in and they gang up on the old guys and they haze them and they raise holy hell with them these older men who used to feel fairly comfortable in prison are scared to death today because of these young cats what faces a young kid who, who's, who's just been busted for say joy riding uh, who's never been busted before, he's going to have to face the, the, uh, the confrontation with, uh, with uh, homosexuality in the institution. Surely somebody is either going to, uh, uh, going to try to entice him or, or, or being locked up uh, in that type of environment, he's going to, to have the desire for, a homosexual re for, for sexual relief, uh, which leaves him nothing but homosexuality to look out. Uh, uh, he's going to face, be facing drugs. There's certainly drugs in the institution. And the pastime being to, uh, uh, the thing being to pass your time as easily as possible. Drugs would be uh, 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 in addition to the things that he's going to face. Uh, they're, they're there. Uh, how they get there, uh, whether it's boarding by the administration, whether it's 
left on the grounds or whether uh, someone who's working on work release brings them in. The point is that they are there. Uh, some, at one point during my incarceration, my own incarceration, uh, it was at such a time when drugs are very, were very hard to get in the street, but there were drugs in the institution. And, and, and at such a price where they can be bought. Now, I think that's, that ought to be enough to frighten any mother about what's going to happen to her son should he enst enter uh, a correctional facility, a correctional institution. After arriving at his assigned tier, Andy Barth steps into the world of cell number four and briefly experiences a genuine moment of truth. The only real moment of, uh, of panic or near panic that I had here was uh, when this door slammed. It, uh, I, I know perfectly well still that I'm here on, a, on an assignment in a special case, but you never really know how many of the guards know that. And when this uh, quite heavy, solid green barred door clanked shut, it's an electrically operated door from somewhere out, uh, out in the hallway, I did have a moment's wondering when it was next going to open. Worrying about when the cell door is next going to open, or open for good, is of course one of the most agonizing pressures of big house life. Unfortunately, extended confinement produces only bitterness in many persons instead of repentance. Well, it, it's, it's just horrible to be in, in, away from your family. That's one thing. And when you uh, uh, get locked up, uh, the first thing they think about is your past record. You get sentenced on your record. So uh, they put you there for 15 or 20 years, lock you up. What does it prove? It doesn't prove anything. It only make you bitter. And she's not a, 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 her child can be small and it can grow up and not even know her if she stay there a length of time. 15 or 20 years is a long time to stay in jail. And in and, and first place, it doesn't prove anything. You put you in the death house, what do you do? Grieve yourself to death. Thinking about every time the key turn, uh, uh, you know, uh, here they come for me. So this is torture, see? We all got in a line and went down to the cafeteria, I guess a little after noon. Everyone uh, picked up one fork and one spoon, uh, all of which were wet, I, I hoped, from a washing machine. Then everybody went and picked up a uh, metal tray. Everybody poured over those, uh, looking, I guess, for a clean one. Not all of them were. But we then went uh, <clears throat> onto the food line. While I was in the dining room, I had uh, the only sort of uh, apparent solicitation that I've experienced here so far. There was a man in the serving line who uh, held my arm and asked my name and said he'd be sure to come up and see me later. And what of the food itself? I can't really say that it was unwholesome. I can't also say that it was uh, really very appetizing or, or very tasty, but for example, they served uh, corned beef hash. There was a fair amount of beef in it, also a fair amount of grease. They served uh, macaroni and cheese, which was a good deal more macaroni than cheese. They also served uh, what they described as iced tea, although it had never had a very close relationship with any tea leaves, I'm afraid. However, it was plentiful. Uh, I assume it was nourishing. I don't think anyone could have gone away from there hungry. I expect, in fact, it's a diet on which you could gain rather a lot of weight. Another person examining prison life for the first time found the food even less to his liking. For young bearded Alan Schumann, an agent for the Department of Parole and Probation, the visit to the Maryland Penitentiary begins on a mid-October morning. At that time, as a participant in the penitentiary's third annual crime seminar, Shulman was one of several men who volunteered to take a tour of the institution. Accompanying him as a guide is Alexander Brown, an inmate. And shortly before noon, Alan Shulman gets his first taste of prison food. Yeah. Hey, 
man I was trying to talk about. See, this, these are the type of conditions that the men are really against. These are the type of things that we've been talking about. We don't want anything like this. This is not even edible food. You can't, just can't possibly imagine eating nothing like that. I could never imagine eating anything like that at home, no. That's what I'm saying. We, I've never eaten anything looking like this. But nevertheless, we are hungry, you know, and we have to eat something, you know. So, you know, we're forced into eating these type of things. After experiencing his first bit of prison food, Alan Shulman stops at the bathroom before moving on to inmate Brown's cell. The floor of that room is covered with a slimy water that causes Shulman some concern. How long has that bathroom been like that? The bathroom's been like that as long as I've been here. And how long is that now? I've been here about three years and some. Are all of them like that? The majority of the bathrooms are, are we have to use it just like that, just like that, all the time. And there's no effort made at all to try to clean no them up? No effort whatsoever. The next inquiry by Alan Shulman is a fairly obvious one. The relationship between inmate and guard or correctional officer. Is there, he asks, a great deal of racism, brutality, unnecessary solitary confinement in order to maintain discipline? Are there secret lockups and punishments? That hallway that led to the maximum security down there, then now that's strictly off limits to us. We can't see that that's at right. all. You won't be able to go over there at all today. How long does a man stay in the maximum security down there? Sometimes, like the minimum I think he can get is 10 days, but sometimes they stay in the whole 10 days. Like they can stay on the, up on lockup for a year. You know, they can stay over there for a year in one cell. You know, no recreation, just come out for a walk, and that's about it. They don't get anybody to talk to at all. The guys, that, the guys that are next door, maybe, you know, oh. they can holler upstairs and dance to Holler upstairs, but they don't get out in the yard to talk to anybody? No. They don't get any kind of recreation? No, none, none whatsoever. Why don't they let us go in the west? They don't want you to go over there because guys have been beaten, you know, and they had these, the guys are still over there, and they want to do something about it, you know, and they would love the opportunity to talk to anybody from outside. When you say beaten, do you mean by guards or by, by other guards, inmates? By guards, right, by guards. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think this is prison rumor that they've been beaten by the guards, or do you know for a it's, fact it's that they fact. have been? It's fact. It's fact. Police uh, have tried to have investigations. Police that are working in here have tried to have investigations on this uh, South Wing area, mm -hmm. and they won't, they won't permit it. So let me understand this. When you say police, you mean the guards that are here? Right. The yeah. guards that work in the institution. They want, you know, to bring about some type of change. They don't like the system the way it's set up. Barry, you just came out of a hammer. Tell us what a hammer is. Well, a hammer is a slang that the inmates give for lockup, uh, solitary confinement, isolation. What happened to you when you go to the hammer? Well, uh, you were placed on a hammer for security reasons. They think you're a threat to uh, the population and troublemaker, in other words. I mean, you're dead to be isolated, whereas though you can't uh, give anyone else any trouble. You're confined in a cell, and that's that, you know. As far as you're concerned, Barry, how were you affected by being in the hammer? Well, uh, mentally, it's a mental ha hazard because, uh, I mean, a man can't do anything. I mean, there's nothing there for a man to do. You're supposed to get a 15-minute uh, walk. I mean, a 15-minute walk, 15 minutes out of 24 hours, that's nothing, you know? Just to be on a tier walking and nothing else, you know what I mean? And how long were you there? Six months. Now, Barry, on another point, uh, many inmates complain about racism. What is the racial situation here? Um, give me a word for terrible, something like that. Give me a word for terrible, something like that. What do you mean, sir? Yeah. I mean, what the way uh, the race issue is in the street was well, ten times as potent in here. It's ten times as potent as here because you got many years oppressed on both sides, you know. Quite naturally, they want to strike out at something, you know what I mean? I mean, this don't apply to everybody. This don't necessarily apply to me. You know, but, uh... Well, you know it. It's on the street. It's ten times potent in here. But who is guilty of the racism as practiced here? The administration, parts of the administration, the guard force, or just... Damn right. I mean, like, the guards, like I said, bro, they could... <laughs> These people, man, they don't know how to uh, relate to people. I mean, they don't know how to socialize with people. Sure, people on their own standards, yeah. But, I mean, people like us... To the real makeup is damn near entirely different. No, you know what I mean? And all they do is add to this. Like, for instance, I was back there on a hammer, and I'm real, 
uh, uh, minor things such as uh, asking God for uh, a change of trees because his tree was dirty. He, uh, he gets mad and all with me and tell me if I don't take this tree, I can't take all. He called me a nigga, but I mean, I'm not saying because he called me a nigga, he was prejudiced or nothing like that. This is more so a thing that is uh, felt, yeah, than a uh, spoken. Believe this. I mean, it ain't like the hacks and all run around there and call people niggas or say they Ku Klux Klimas or the blacks say they hardcore militants or nothing like this. This is a thing that's felt. I mean, you can sense this. I mean, you ain't got to uh, speak with a man to know where a man's standing at now. I mean, his action shows this. His action shows this. The traditional relationship between correctional officer and inmate is a complex one. At Hagerstown, for example, there are more than 300 officers of whom one is black. The situation creates a communications gap. But the problem is one of geography more than any other factor. In addition, most officers, white or black, seem to have trouble communicating because they do not want to be caught in the middle and fear the inmates will use them or play games with them if they are lenient. Um, majority of the inmates, though, they have their little tricks that they do on you when you first come here. When you're a new man, they always trick you. When you're a new man, until you're here long enough to where you can really figure the situation out. For instance, when you're making count in the morning, it's not too bad here on the tier because you can lock the men in on the tier while you're making count. But in the dormitories where it's all open, there's one officer that makes the count back there. And while you're going through, you might count a man that's on a D row on the bed and go past him. And while your back's to, he's to your back, he'll jump over in the A row. And when you come back around the A row, you've counted that man twice and he knows it. And you mess your count up and you have to make a recount. And it's really hard to get a count going up there. But they'll do that to you for a while until they really get to know you to find out what kind of officer you are. Every man is an individual, and you have to treat him as, a, as an individual. But you just can't lock a man up, put him away over here, and forget all about him. It's just not done that way. But as a correctional officer myself, you don't have the time as a correctional officer to go to find out every individual's problem, which is impossible to. And uh, we're understaffed here. Uh, we have counselors here that are supposed to find what their problems are to try to help them out, but uh, it's just impossible to get 1,400 men down and find out each an individual problem of every man because you just can't do it. Uh, the correctional officers have as many or more hang-ups than the inmates do. Now, you see, if, if a man is working on a particular shift, what he does on that shift that's correct can cause him to get demerits, to get written up on the next shift. The guys are caught in the middle all the time. There's all kinds of things that could be done to make the life easier for the guard. But you see, if the guard is, is kept in between all the time, he's going to be hard on the inmates. A man, if he's a CO1, 2, or 3, is not allowed to, to talk to the inmates. I, I've had men tell me how they have seen uh, inmates who they went to school with. One man was on the police force with an inmate. And he told me that in order for him to be able to talk with his friend, he had to go in, wait till the guy went into his cell and then go into his cell with him so they couldn't see him talking to the man from Center Hall. The, uh, a lot of the, the guards on the force, particularly the newer correctional officers, want to get involved with treatment. They see a lot of the problems and they want to help the guys, but they're not permitted to. And the big hang up in this system is the same as in virtually any company throughout the United States. It's middle management that resists the changes. Top management wants to change in many cases. The lower echelon wants to change, but middle management won't permit it. After several hours, hardly enough to get more than a touch of institutional life, WMAR-TV reporter Andy Barth's sentence is over. Despite the brevity of his visit, however, he counts it as a valuable experience. My most immediate feeling just on, on coming out through those big doors is one of physical relief. That uh, none of the terrible things that people told me might happen to me did happen. There was no assault and uh, no real physical discomfort. Of course, I think that should be put in the framework of my having been here for only three or four hours. And uh, the thought of being here for a week or two weeks or two months or two years, which is what I was telling people in there I was going to be here, is mighty unpleasant. I think that uh, if you get along in that system up there, you can probably survive it, but that other inmates could make it mighty unpleasant for you if they chose to do so. 
I think two years of this, if uh, I were sentenced to two years here, I think that would be pretty hard to take. Looking back over this day or the part of it that I spent, there were periods of boredom already, uh, at least an hour or so. I wasn't here for a full day and I can't really imagine what I'd do with myself over two years here. I guess uh, I'm supposed to come out of here some way improved. I should come out of here better than when I came in. Whether two years here would uh, move me in that direction, I'm not sure. But what of the man who is not free to leave in a few hours, for whom the days become as monotonous, colorless, and endless as the bars that define his existence? Does confinement change him for better or worse? Perhaps the person with the most extensive background to answer is Maryland's former Commissioner of Correction, Joseph G. Cannon. Well, I believe his chances of being benefited by the big house concept, the large institution concept today, is, is rather slim. And this is, you know, not something new, because I have said this over and over again before committees in the General Assembly and, and in Washington before Senate uh, subcommittees, that the present correctional institutional correctional operation is is very super superficial getting to a very few people who are committed to the system every year and I've used the figure which I can't back up but which I think probably is optimistic that at any one time we can only reach probably 20 percent of the population with any meaningful correctional type programs the other 80 percent tends to spin through the system and go back into the community either a little worse off or quite a bit worse off for the experience or maybe a little better because they themselves have been able to mature and, and, and gain something from the experience.